Okay, look at this map and tell me if you can see what's wrong with it. Do you see it? Okay, try this map. What's wrong with this one? Okay, well, here's another, and it also has something very wrong about it. In fact, I'll go one step further and say it. Every one of these maps is a lie. How can a map be a lie? He's crazy. Well, stick with me, and I'll show you exactly what's wrong with those maps, but we got some ground to cover first. And if this is the first time we're meeting, my name is Steve Heimler, and you are taking AP Human Geography, which for a lot of you is your first AP course. And I know this class can seem like a giant hairy beast with meatball breath that could curl your toe hairs, but stick with me because I'm about to explain up everything real nice for you. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well, let's get to it. Okay, if you are hoping to crush that AP exam in your mind vice, then you have to begin at the beginning and get real cozy with maps because these sweet little bippies are at the very heart of the discipline of human geography. And the reason maps are so important is because they are tools that depict spatial patterns. All right, now hold on. I just started hurling vocabulary around like a cold fish at a seaside market. So let me define what I'm talking about. The word spatial is related to the word space. So spatial patterns are concerned with how and where where different geographic features occur on the Earth's surface. So for example, look at where the 10 largest US cities are located on this map. And what a geographer gets positively giddy about is trying to figure out why these cities are spatially arranged like this and not like this. Or what does it mean that the two most populous cities are on opposite sides of the country? Why does Texas have three of the largest cities, but this area up here has got bupkis? Okay, now there are four distinct kinds of spatial patterns you're gonna see represented in maps. First is absolute distance, which is a distance that can be measured in feet or miles, or if you're nasty, kilometers. For example, the absolute distance between Yosemite National Park and Rocky Mountain National Park is 954 miles. However, there's a related concept that cannot be depicted on maps, namely relative distance, which measures social, cultural, or political differences or similarities between two locations. For example, this is a map showing the income levels across a neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. You see this little green square? People who live there make a lot of money and likely perform their morning constitutional on gold-plated toilets. But the people who live here in the red square, they make very little money. So these two areas are only a block apart in terms of absolute absolute distance, but in terms of relative distance, they're much further apart in terms of the lifestyles that people are living in each place. Okay, the second kind of spatial pattern depicted on maps is absolute direction, which is essentially north, south, east, and west, also known as cardinal directions. But again, there is a related concept that cannot be depicted on maps, namely relative direction, which describes one location in reference to another. For example, if you're a freshman, you don't know your way around your school yet, maybe you need to ask your teacher for directions to your second period classroom. And if your teacher gives you absolute directions, well, just go north by northwest for 32 paces and then do east for 14 paces and you'll find it. Well then you might as well drop out of school because you're never gonna find that class. But if she says take a left out of my room or right down the next hall and then you'll find it, well then that's actually kind of helpful and that's what we mean by relative direction. Now the third spatial pattern depicted on maps is clustering and dispersal, both of which show how different phenomena are organized across an area. If phenomena are clustered, that means they're close together, like apartment buildings in New York City. But if phenomena are dispersed, that means they're far apart, like farms in the Midwest. And then finally the fourth spatial pattern depicted on maps is elevation, which measures the height of geographic features relative to sea level. This part right here is real high, and this part is real low. Okay, now any map worth its salt is going to have a few common features, and you need to know what they mean. First, you have the map scale, which tells you how distance on the map relates to distance in the real world. And you might see it like this in a ratio form, or you might see it represented by a bar, but they're both telling you the same thing. Second, maps include some way to reckon direction, and usually this is represented by a compass rose, which indicates the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Or if the compass rose is a little spicier, it might give you intermediate directions as well. And third, maps depict the Earth's surface at various scales. Now hold on, didn't we just talk about scale like 30 seconds ago? Well, kind of, but this is not the same thing, so pay attention. A map scale tells us about distance, but the scale of the map tells us how much of the world we're seeing on this map, and this is about the whole map itself. So a large scale map zooms into a particular area and has a lot more detail. But a small scale map zooms out to a national or a global scale and has less detail. So don't get those two confused. Too late. Well, bummer. Okay, now there are two broad categories of maps that you need to know for this course, namely reference maps and thematic maps. But hey, before I explain that, let me ask you a question. Do you want to get an A in this class and a five on your exam in May? <laughs> I thought you did. Well, if you need help making that happen, then click the link in the description and check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to study as fast as possible. It's got exclusive whole unit review videos, note guides to follow along, practice multiple choice questions, a full length practice exam, and answers for every dang thing I just mentioned. So if doing well is the kind of thing you're into, then get that clicky finger out and have a look. Anyway, back to the two kinds of maps you need to know. No. First, you need to know about reference maps, which display specific geographic locations. For example, here's a road map, which shows the location of, you know, roads or highways. Or here's a political map, which doesn't show roads, but instead shows the boundaries of states and countries. And probably for most of you, when you think about the maps that you've seen in your life, you're thinking about reference maps. And the most important thing to remember here is that reference maps display geographic locations. And I emphasize that because the other category of map you need to know is thematic maps, and they specialize in displaying geographic information. Not locations, 
information. If you're about as confused as a bagel in a bucket of grits, well, then let me try to explain the difference by showing you the five kinds of thematic maps you're going to see over and over again in this course. First is the Choropleth map, which visualizes data from a specific geographic region in different colors. So let's suppose that the question that's keeping you up at night is how many Anglicans live in Australia and where do they live? <laughs> I know, it's like I'm inside your brain. Anyway, a Choropleth map like this can help you answer that question. And in order to interpret this mishmash of colors, you need to pay attention to this scale right here. So that tells us that the darker the green, the more Anglican there are in a location, and the lighter the green, the fewer. Smell the one I'm stepping in? Good. Okay, now the second kind of thematic map you need to know is a cartogram, which distorts the size of geographic shapes to display differences in data. So here's what a normal world map looks like. It's a lie. I know, I, I'll, I'll get there, I will get there. But suppose you wanted to know which of the world's countries devoted most of its resources to organic farming. Well, this cartogram is gonna tell you. Now I know this looks like less of a map and more like somebody ate a map and vomited it back up, but look, it's actually very helpful. Just by distorting the sizes of the land masses, you can see easily that Australia is positively killing it when it comes to organic farming. Russia? Yeah, not so much. Okay, now the third kind of thematic map you need to know is the graduated symbol map, or you might see this called a proportional map. Two different names, same thing, and why? Well, because AP Human Geography hates you. Anyway, graduated means that the symbol grows in proportion to the data represented. For example, here's a map of Europe which tells us which countries are the wealthiest. So over here in Western Europe, they got boom boom flowing like a river, but in Eastern Europe, well, I mean, you guys are doing just great. You just believe in yourself. Okay, now the fourth kind of thematic map you need to know is the dot distribution map, which uses dots to visualize the location of certain data points. And hey, I can see you're starting to glaze over, but hey, stay with me, it's story time. So back in the mid 1800s, there was an outbreak of a disease in London called cholera, and it was making a lot of people really sick on account of it made them poop until they were severely dehydrated. So that's fun. Anyway, the best explanation people could figure out as to why this disease was spreading so rapidly was because of bad air. Yeah, that's it, that was the best they could do. But then came along our boy, Jon Snow, who visited every place where an infection occurred and then plotted them on a, wait for it, dot distribution map, which you can see right here. And in doing this, he discovered that the infections were spatially arranged around a common water pump, and long story short, he discovered that the people were getting sick because the water was contaminated. Why are you not falling out of your seats right now? That's astonishing! Okay, whatever. Or instead of disease, you might see a map like this in which the dots represent population. So we can see that in Sweden, everyone lives down here and not so much up here in the butt-cold Arctic Circle. Okay, finally, the fifth kind of thematic map you need to know is the Isoline map, which uses lines to depict changes in data. And it could be any kind of data, but you'll probably see this most often in maps depicting changes changes in elevation. So here where the lines are close, that means data is changing rapidly. In this case, you're looking at a really steep hill. But if the lines are further apart, the data is changing slowly, like here, where it's just sort of a gradual descent. Okay, now that we've become relatively cozy and acquainted with what maps are and what they are good for, we can finally figure out what's wrong with all those maps I showed you in the beginning. And here's where I tell you that all maps are selective in what they present and distorted in some way, and let me explain. In case you didn't know, the Earth is a sphere, and if there are any flat earthers watching this, well, you know, I mean, this probably is not the course for you, but I still love you. But anyway, the Earth is a sphere, and any attempt to represent a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional map will always mean that something doesn't look right, that there's gonna be some kind of lie in every map. And the best way to understand this is to consider five different map projections that you're gonna need to know. First is the Mercator projection, which is a map whose latitude and longitude lines meet at right angles, which means that it's a really good map for determining direction. But the lie of this map is that while landforms are accurate near the equator, the further north or south you go, you're gonna see prodigious amounts of distortion. Now, this map was created by Europeans during the Age of Discovery, and it was very useful for guiding ships to distant lands, and bonus, it makes Europe look way bigger than it really is. Anyway, the classic example of Mercator distortion is Greenland. On the Mercator map, Greenland is about five metric buttloads larger than it is in real life. Look, if we move it down to the equator, you can see its true size, and oh, look how cute it is. Okay, the second map projection you need to know is the Peters projection, which was developed to challenge the Eurocentric Mercator projection by depicting continents according to the true size of their landmass. But the lie here is that while the size of the landmass is are accurate, the true shape of them is uh, wonky as heck. Okay, the third map projection to know is the Good Homolysine projection, which accurately represents the shapes of the land masses, but has to break up the oceans to do so, which is, you know, a lot. And then the fourth map projection you need to know is the polar projection, which views the world from the north or south pole. In this kind of projection, directions are true and the land shapes are accurate near the middle, but distortion is pretty obvious as you move from the center. And finally, the fifth map projection you need to know is the Robinson projection, which distributes all kinds of distortion to all parts of the map and and this way is a kind of compromise between the Mercator and Peters projections. Now there is some distortion in the land masses, but it's pretty minimal, and that's why modern geographers tend to prefer the Robinson projection. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing for unit one, and click here to grab my AP Hug Heimler review guide if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May. Thanks for coming around, and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.